Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all again this afternoon. I'm glad that you were able to come back. Today we're going to, this afternoon we're going to be talking about understanding Hinduism. I will tell you right up front that my purpose this afternoon is to cause all of your heads to explode. Because that's probably what's going to happen. Uh, in many ways, I've taught a lot on comparative religions. Uh, the lectures that I've given are available online, not just on our website uh, in Me from Mexico, but also on YouTube. And we have had by far more people watch the video on Hinduism than any other. And I think it's because, and many of them are Hindus, I know because a lot of them have written to me. Um, most of them are very approving of it, some of them have, have questions about it, but that's the nature of Hinduism, uh, as you're going to find out. In many ways, when you talk about comparative religions, it's a difficult place to start. We have to start here because, of course, this is the part of the world we're in. But anytime you talk about comparative religions, you pretty much have to start with Hinduism because it is the oldest of the world religions. And so you begin here, but it's almost kind of a shame for several reasons that you'll pick up as we go along. One of them is, it is unbelievably complicated. And there are many different ways of looking at it, but we'll get into that. Um, Tomorrow, of course, we are in, oh, and, and you're going to get Zoroastrianism as an extra added bonus today only. Uh, we will talk about that because you'll have an opportunity to see a Zoroastrian um, Tower of Silence uh, in Mumbai yeah. if you choose that excursion. Not all of you will see that, but if you choose that excursion. And then after Mumbai, we will have two lectures the following day on understanding other Indian religions. Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism all came out of uh, Hinduism and out of uh, this part of the world, uh, well, out of Hinduism. Uh, Buddhism began in India, but that ended up mostly moving further east. You know, Buddhism is not, it, it was pretty much overwhelmed by Hinduism in India itself. And then in the afternoon, we'll get into some of the historical stuff, India's great empires, the Mauryan Gupta, and the Mughal Empire. So we'll talk about some of the historical things that happened after all of this. But uh, as sort of a preface for talking about Hinduism, I want to first introduce the whole question of talking about world religions. Um, in terms of what is religion, I'm sure we all think we have an idea of that, but even that question sort of gets you into complications. One of my favorite definitions for religion comes from the Global Philosophy of Religion book, um, and it is, genuine, genuine religion is fundamentally a search for meaning beyond materialism, meaning beyond the physical world. A world religion tradition is a set of symbols and rituals, myths and stories, concepts and truth claims which a historical community believes give ultimate meaning to life via the connection to a transcendent beyond the natural order. Transcendent means other than us, beyond us. So I think this is a good definition of what religion means. Other people might define religion as being any belief in or worship of a god or gods, a belief in the supernatural the service or worship of God or the supernatural in some way, but people differ in that. A lot of the terms that we in the West use for religion are, are difficult to apply to a lot of the Eastern religions. Even, even the, the names of them did not come into use until quite a bit later. There are three types of religions probably to break them down, um, and this is my, my own breakdown. World religions, which Hinduism falls in that category for sure, are those extant, meaning still existing, faiths uh, which are historically transcultural and international. They're not located in one, spa one place. They are uh, international and by definition they are, are more significant in size. The exception to that would be Judaism, which is certainly international and transcultural and has had such, such a massive effect on the world, although there are only 14 million Jews alive in the world today. So um, that's kind of an exception to, to the usual definitions. The second definition we would use are indigenous religions, smaller, cultural, spe cultural specific, culture specific, or nature, uh, nation, I can't even read, it's too dark up here, or nation specific religious groups. This would be something that is isolated to a particular geographical area or culture. So not transcultural, not international. And finally, new religious movements, those faiths that are recently developed meaning they may become world religions someday, we don't know, but there are uh, new religions developing all the time. When we talk about religions, uh, these are what would be considered the world religions. The largest of them, this is by size, is Christianity at about 2.2 billion. These numbers up here are in thousands. Um, Islam is the second largest at about 1.6 billion. Islam, as many people know, is the fastest growing of all the religions. It's believed by 2025 it may actually be the largest. 
A lot of people don't realize, though, that Islam is not primarily growing faster than any other faith because of conversions, but rather because the, Islam, the countries that claim Islam as the predominant religion tend to have the highest birth rates in the world. And uh, many of the, for instance, nations that uh, are Christian or some of the other world religions have very low birth rates. And so Islam is growing primarily, in comparison to the others, by having more uh, more children. This is one of the issues in Israel, for instance. Um, one of the real challenges, on the last cruise I did a talk about history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East, and I talked about the Israel-Palestine conflict. One of the reasons that Israel will never be able to accept a two-state solution to the problem they have there is that would mean giving you know, one person one vote. Well, the, the non-Jewish population, Israel was, was created to be a homeland for the Jewish people, someplace that they could feel secure. And right now, there are more Muslims in the area of uh, what we know of as Israel and the Palestinian territories than there are Jews. If it was one person, one vote, the Jewish homeland could be voted out of existence, and so they're never going to do that. And that's a population issue, again. Um, Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world, uh, uh, running about 13% of the world's population at 1.1 billion. These numbers are approximates. It's not like they go around and say, okay, everybody who's a Hindu, raise your hand. And so we have an exact, and they don't do this kind of analysis very often. But then from there we go down to Buddhism, Chinese traditional religions, which includes Confucianism, Taoism, Shamanism, Sikhism, which we will talk about later, Judaism, Baha'ism, and Jainism. Jainism is also a very ancient religion that we'll get into. Shinto, the national religion of Japan, etc. In terms of just distribution, the dark sort of brownish color, uh, there's two tones there, are, uh, is Islam. It's the lighter color is predominantly Shia. This is Sunni. I'll, I'll do a talk about Islam toward the end of our cruise and explain a lot about that if you don't understand it. Um, then, of course, we have Christian. Um, the, this area here is really what we're talking about when we talk about Hinduism. It is uh, India, Nepal, Bhutan a little bit, but predominantly India and Nepal. Um, 80, more than 80% of the population of India, which is the second most populous country in, on the planet, are Hindus. So we'll get into that. This is a different way of looking at it in terms of data founding, which are the oldest. Hinduism is considered the oldest of the world's religions, having begun about 4,000 BC. Uh, so that makes it 6,000 years old. There's a lot of belief that the fundamental writings of Islam are based upon oral traditions that go back much further. Some people propose even 10,000 BC as when the earliest of the Vedas, the Rig Veda and some of the other documents that I'll explain, that they were an oral tradition then, later were written down, and then it became formalized as a religion sometime around 4,000 BC. Judaism is second, around 2,000 BC. Um, Buddhism, Chinese traditional. Now, I mentioned that uh, Jainism is very old. It was only formulated in, in or made formal in uh, the fifth century BC, but again, it's based upon oral traditions that probably go back to 2,000 BC or earlier. So it's a very old religion as well. There's one thing about this um, that is quite unusual. There's a period of time of only about 100 years in the 5th, uh, 5th and 6th centuries BC when four of the major religious traditions in the world were all founded. In fact, more than four because the Chinese traditional religions includes Confucius, Taoism, and Shamanism. But the Buddha, Siddhartha Buddha, that we'll talk about after Mumbai, um, the, the Confucius, and Lao Tzu, who is the founder of Chinese traditional, and there are different ways to pronounce that. Um, I'll, I'm going with the usual understanding. Um, and they were all alive at that time. Shinto as a faith and Jainism all formally were developed within a hundred years of each other. This is such an important, it's such a strange phenomenon. Um, anthropologists don't really understand why it is that the world has so much religious energy in that 100 year period of time, but there's a special name for it. It's called the Axial Age. Uh, we might talk about that a little bit more when we talk about Buddhism. Um, one other thing I will mention, you'll notice that I have BC and AD on here. Uh, it's very common, in, especially in scholarly arenas right now, that they have changed that. BC and AD are the old uh, way of identifying before Christ and Anno Domini. Anno Domini means the year of our Lord. 
Today in scholarly circles, for sure, they use BCE, which means before the Common Era, and CE, the Common Era, in order to take any reference to a specific religion, Christianity or the birth of Christ out of it. They can't just change the dating system because everybody's you know, adapted to that, but they have changed the, uh, the reference. I stay with BC and AD because a lot of the stuff's confusing anyway, and I don't want to add one more confusing layer to it. So I stay, stick with BC and AD. All right, Hinduism. The Hindu religion does not refer to itself as Hinduism. In fact, and I spoke to a gentleman about this right before we started, the word Hindu is, an, um, is a term used by those outside of India, particularly the Persians. It's a reference to the people who live the other side of the Indus River. And they, um, they called it Hindustan, the people who lived there they called Hindus. It was not a religious term originally. And so it became a common parlance for the Hindu religion, the dominant religion of the Indian people. But again, that's a Western term. In, in Hinduism itself, they refer to it either as the Sanatana Dharma, the eternal way or eternal law. You always have to be careful when you start interpreting other languages into English. Way, law, we have very different connotations. It could be either one, but it basically means that it is something beyond human origins. It's also called the, the Vaidika Dharma, or the way or law of the Vedas. The Vedas are the most ancient writings that exist for uh, some of the most ancient writings in the human experience. Um, probably in terms of religious writings, they're among the very oldest, possibly equaled by some of the Egyptian writing, but it's very, very old. Um, Hindu, as I, I just said this, and now I've got it on a slide, isn't that amazing? Um, that, that it was, the inhabitants were called Hindus, the religion Hinduism, the world old, oldest extant religion. We have examples of very ancient religions that don't exist anymore. Sometime between 10,000 BC and uh, 2700 BC was the founding, and it started orally. How do you decide when a religion actually started? Was it when the first oral traditions were created? When they were first written down? When the last of them were written down? When they had a formal structure? It's very difficult to decide that. But th these are the dates that we generally give it. Now, some people don't even think that Hinduism is a religion. It does not meet many of the characteristics or criteria of other religions. There is no single founder. There are no prophets. There are teachers, swamis and others that are teachers of, of the um, of Hinduism. No uh, single concept of deity, no single theological system, no single holy text, no central religious authority. In some ways, people would argue, it doesn't really fit the mold of any other religion that exists. And even more than that, Hinduism can is perceived as very different. I told you that the videos that I have of lectures on Hinduism that I have online, people have come to them and some people really love them. And some people say, you completely missed it. Well, I'm not offended by that because Hinduism is perceived so differently by different people that I would have expected that. Any tact that I take or any way I present it, somebody's going to disagree. Um, it's, oh, it is variously perceived by people as monotheistic, having only one god that is manifested in different ways, polytheistic, having multiple gods, henotheistic, henotheism is when you have multiple gods but you choose to worship only one of them, uh, pantheistic, which says that all things are part of God, that you know you add everything up together and that is God. Panentheistic, which says that all things are God and then He's something more than that. The Native American religions are an example of that. They have, you know, the spirit of the mountain and the spirit of the wolf and the spirit of the river, but then connected, all of those things are combined. But above that, the great spirit is even more. It's all of those things plus. That's panentheism, or even atheism. Some people would insist that Hinduism is, does not really believe in God, but rather it is a way of life. It is a philosophical approach to how we live our lives. And so very, very different interpretations are possible on all of this. It's very difficult, therefore, to even define Hinduism. There's a principle called the Ishta Devada within Islam, which says, uh, it, it literally means your chosen deity. And it says that every person must find their own way, their own uh, deity to worship, their own path, their own philosophy, which will bring them to the objectives of human life. And so by very definition, a major principle of Hinduism is that, you know, you can take a very different path, even not believing in God, but believing in the principles behind it, uh, behind Hinduism, that would work for you. Um, 
there are a number of beliefs that are consistent among all people who, who experience or who believe in the Hindu direction, whatever their particulars are. There is a belief in transmigration of the soul, what we would call reincarnation. That um, there's, it's called samsara, that there is a cycle that every person goes through, which is birth, life, death, and rebirth. And that there's a, cons a consistency of that throughout all human life. There is a sense in which there, there are many different manifestations of the one divine essence, which is called Brahman. Um, all, whether they believe those others are actually deities or just avatars. The word avatar is, is not just a movie with blue people in it. Um, avatar means an earthly manifestation of a deity, what we might call an incarnation. And some of the most popular of the deities in, in Hinduism, like Krishna and Rama, are seen as avatars of Vishnu, probably one of the most popular senior gods, if you will. Um, there's very much a sense amongst all adherence to Hinduism of karma, that um, everything you do has consequences, that there is a cause and effect that exists in the world, and what you do will have consequences for you, not only immediately, but long term. And because of this idea of samsara, that you're coming back, then if you do evil now, then, then you may be reborn in a much worse situation than you are now. Uh, that whatever you're suffering in this life or whatever blessings you have in this life are a result of either of your conduct in the past because of karma. I had a friend once who I was teaching some of this stuff and, and he listened to it and he said, so this whole samsara thing, this reincarnation, this transmigration soul coming back, he said, sounds to me like if you die and then you come back, if you've been really good, you get to come back as a person. If you've been really bad, you come back as a frog. And if you've been really, really, really good, you don't have to come back at all. <laughs> well, that's actually pretty accurate. Right? That's, that's fairly accurate in terms of the idea of, of transmigration of the soul. Um, there are paths of righteousness that can improve your destiny in that regard. And then there is the principle that not having to come back at all called moksha. Moksha is when you have sufficiently disciplined yourself and met the, the, the expectations, have achieved the righteousness that you should have, then you are not forced to be reborn. Because in both Hinduism and Buddhism especially, you know, this is one of the revelations of the Buddha we'll talk about, is that life is suffering. And so the idea of not having to come back at all is a benefit. That's moksha, the, to, to get out of the cycle of suffering. But you have to achieve that. You have to accomplish it. One of the major principles I'll talk about in Hinduism is Dharma. Dharma is very simply the, um, the path that we have to follow and the, the, the basic principle or philosophies of life. We'll get into that, all right? Um, there are a number of different texts that Hinduism bases itself on. Um, they are called Shastras. There's two primary group of Shastras that came uh, over a period of time. The first group is called Shruti, or Herd Literature. I'm going to go ahead and put all these up here. Herd Literature, or from ancient Hindu monks, they came to an understanding of what, it, what life should be, and they began to uh, express these truths. They were memorized, passed on. So these, these are the truths that we've heard. The first major kind of it, and the oldest writings in Hinduism, are the Vedas. <coughs> Uh, the Rig Veda, especially, there are four Vedas. The Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the uh, Yajur Veda, and the Athara Veda. Each of these are statements of wisdom and truth and the most ancient writings. The Rig Veda is, is the Veda of uh, royal knowledge. It's the most important. It's the one that has hymns of praise to various deities. I said this morning, if you weren't here, that Hinduism has approximately 330 million deities. Now, more than that, um, the, the idea of many is that Brahman, the great essence, the absolute essence, the absolute truth behind all that is alive, that Brahman inhabits all beings. It inhabits you he, and me and trees and frogs and everything else. And so therefore, anything that's alive is in some way a deity because it, in, it is inhabited by the divine essence, the absolute truth. And so, some people would say that there are even more than 330 million deities in Hinduism. And this, this leads to some of the principles in terms of actions that they, they pursue in, um, in Hinduism. 
Within the Vedas, the Samaveda and uh, Yajura Veda are simply reorganizing pieces of the Rig Veda, the oldest and most important of them, for use in various kinds of services and rituals and things like that. The Athara Veda is actually a collection of various almost magical incarn uh, uh, incantations. It, in fact, is considered very dangerous. The story is that women who have read it casually and not taken precautions, uh, who, if they were pregnant, they had miscarriages because it involves um, various ways of blessing and cursing and, and whatnot, and it's, it's not very, very often read. The next level is the Upanishads. The Upanishads, uh, Lily Tomlin one time in Science for, Cell, uh, for Intelligent Life in the Universe, you ever see that play? Um, yeah, very funny. Lily Tomlin's hilarious in that. And, there's a line in there that said, well, yeah, just this morning I was reading in the Upanishads, um, which you don't usually hear people say that. Uh, the Upanishads are very ancient philosophical texts. They deal with the meaning of life and how we achieve the high objectives in life, but they really are philosophy. Some people focus on the Upanishads if they especially see Hinduism as more a philosophy than a religion. So the Upanishads are very ancient writings of philosophical wisdom. We then have the second kind, the Shruti or Hurt literature is first, and then the Shriti or memorized or remembered. These are epic stories. These are poetry. Uh, these are the great stories, not so much teaching stuff as examples that you can learn from. There is the uh, Ramayana is a story about Rama, one of the manifestations or incarnations or avatars of Vishnu. The um, Mahabra uh, Mahabharata is one of the most popular writings, it is the longest epic poem in the world of any kind. And massive, I mean, the, the, the Ramayana is seven volumes. These are not light reading. They're not something you go, oh, I'll take that on the cruise, I'll knock that out in a couple of days. Um, the Bhagavad Gita is one of the most important, probably the most important writing to most people in the Hindu religion. It is the one that gives guidance to life. It was especially important, for instance, to the Mahatma Gandhi, Mohandas K. Gandhi. He called it his spiritual dictionary because it is about self-sacrifice and the need for self-sacrifice in order to achieve what is necessary and good in the world. And so much of his doctrine of uh, self-sacrifice, of uh, passive uh, resistance, came from the things that he felt he learned from the Bhagavad Gita. So these are some of the major reading. And you'll notice that some of these, like the Bhagavad Gita is a section of the Mahabharata because most of this is too big for people really to read. Um, and besides, it, to, for someone who's low income, somebody who's poor, they probably wouldn't have access to that. But the priests, the Hindu priests, will have memorized some or most or even all of this and the these texts will be available at local local hindu shrines and temples so it is accessible to people but there are smaller versions of it that people really get into in addition there are also sutras which are collections of aphorisms you know one-liners if you will in the form of manual or text um, the for instance the kama sutra i'm going to talk about kama in a minute that is um, Kama is one of the objectives of human life, and it is the seeking of satisfaction and pleasure, including sexual pleasure. The Kama Sutra, it, it's a lot of things. It talks about the the, perf the ideal life. You know, you wake up in the morning and you greet the sun and you arrange flowers and you enjoy the smell of them and you, you know, you meet your loved one and you talk to good friends and you pet your dog and you do all these wonderful things that will give you a satisfying life including later meeting your loved one and at that point the Kama Sutra becomes a sex manual because the achieving of pleasure is one of the is what Kama means the achieving of personal the satisfaction of personal desires including sexual pleasure so it's very popular in the West for some reason the Kama Sutra um, and there's also the principle of tantric sex which is part of uh, has come out of Hinduism as well there then are the Puranas the ancient texts that eulogize the deities that uh, speak in great flowing terms about the deities and then the Ari, uh, ariyakas the ritual sacrifice part of the vedas to instruct people how they need to proceed with uh, ritual worship of the various deities now i'm going to give you five principles four denominations 11 beliefs three karmas four yogas four purposes ten disciples uh, disciplines and four classes 
told you your head was going to explode. I did not, didn't I warn you this was going to be complicated? Uh, and a partridge in a pear tree. Um, <laughs> usually, if you saw my last two lectures, I use a lot of images on the screen. I don't like to just stick words on the screen, but in the case, there's so much detail here. The only way to get through it in 45 minutes or so is to put the principles up and let you see them with your eyes as well as listen to me. Or you, And I'm not unrealistic. You're only going to get about 3% of this anyway. Uh, but if later on, when you're in Mumbai or uh, Bangalore or anywhere else, if you hear a term, expression, and it links back, then I've done my job. So that's why we're doing this. I don't expect you to remember all this. The five principles of Hinduism. Number one, God exists. Now when we say that, they're talking about God being the Brahman, or they talk about the absolute Om. Um, I'll talk about Om in a minute. You, you've seen the movies where somebody's sitting there going, Om. That's supposed to be an expression of Brahman, the absolute reality. And uh, I'll show you the symbol for that in a minute. The, the expression of Brahman, the absolute essence who is God, is in many forms, especially the trinity or trimurti, they call it in, in uh, Hindi, of Brahma, who is the God creator, the Vishnu, who is the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. And I'll show you photographs of them in just a moment. Um, the second principle is that all human beings are divine. As I said, all people, in fact, all living things, have present in them some aspect of the Brahman, this essential um, truth or absolute reality that exists, what they would call the sumas res in, in Latin. Um, so the idea is that God is in you. This is where a lot of the sort of New Age religions, um, and by the way, they're not new. They're, uh, they're very old. The idea that find the God that is in you comes really back to the ancient uh, Hindu ideas that all of us have a divinity in us because all of us have inside us the presence of the Brahman, the absolute reality who is divine. Then there is unity of existence through love, the idea that we have an obligation to love, to do good, and that we therefore, in that way, we are united with all other existing creatures. The idea of religious harmony that there is no, should be no conflict in this. And then the knowledge of what are called the three Gs. Ganja, which is the sacred river. The river Ganges is considered actually a deity with Hinduism. And it is an expectation that, that every practicing Hindu will at one time or another in their life wash in the Ganges, no matter where else they are in the world. Those who are close to it do that much more often, but it is considered the sacred river. And this has a lot to do with the purity idea, the washing in the Ganges. The second G is Gita, the sacred script that we just talked about. The, uh, the Shruti and the, the, to be able to go back and read the Vedas and the Upanishads and to focus your life on that. And then the Gyatri, which is a sacred mantra. It can be the Om, the, the, the ancient writings give a number of different mantras, which you might think of as prayers, although they're usually sung. And by the practicing of these pre-written prayers, mantras, you can achieve um, greater closeness with the divine. The Hindu concept of deity, as I've mentioned several times already, the Brahman, and don't confuse Brahman and Brahma, that's different. Brahman is the one, the supreme absolute, the unity of all reality, the ultimate uh, of all existence. It is the source of all that is alive. Then we have the Trimurti, or the basic trinity of the three most important or powerful gods. There is Brahma, again, don't confuse Brahman with Brahma. Brahma is the creator god. Now, sounds pretty powerful, but of the major gods, Brahma is actually one of the least powerful. The, the belief in Hinduism is that Brahma had to have a stronger god present in order for him to be able to do his creation. But then the second is Vishnu. Vishnu, who is often manifest, the, who is, has avatars of Krishna and Rama, two of the most popular avatar deities, is the preserver. Vishnu is considered by many, perhaps more than any other um, deity, as being the most important and most powerful. I think it's fair to say that, that from our perspective, well, I believe, that um, we need to look at Hinduism as a henotheistic religion, which means you can believe that many gods exist, but you choose to worship just one. In the case of Vishnu, those people who choose Vishnu as the one god they're especially going to focus on and worship, because let's face it, you can't focus on 330 million gods. 
uh, they follow a path called Vaishnavism. Vaishnavism. That is a denomination, if you will, within Hinduism that focuses on the worship of Vishnu. The third of the Trimurti or Trinity is Shiva, the destroyer. That sounds worse than it is because the idea is that something must die in order for something to be reborn. So as the destroyer, because they don't believe that when you die, you really are gone, they believe you're going to come back unless you've achieved moksha, then Shiva is actually seen as a positive for the most part. But Shiva is the one, there are some negative sides to Shiva, some uh, others like Kali and Durga, two female goddesses who are avatars of Shiva that are pretty nasty creatures. Uh, that you, you saw Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade was last night? Did we show it last night or this night? Tonight. The whole thing where they're, um, oh, it's the Temple of Doom, that's it. Where they're reaching in and pulling out people's hearts, those were worshipers of Kali, who is one of the uh, manifestations or avatars of Shiva. It took kind of a dark turn there for a while. And then we also have Shakti or Devi, that is the Divine Mother. Those who, by the way, um, choose to worship Shiva primarily, are uh, they, the, their denomination is called Shivaism. Those who worship Shakti, the Divine Mother, or Devi, she's sometimes called, practice Shaktiism. Um, and then there are other gods. Ganesha. You all know Ganesha? What's distinctive about Ganesha? Elephant, elephant head. Who wouldn't know that? Ganesha, the elephant headed god, and most people don't notice the fact that when Ganesha is represented, this elephant headed god is riding on a mouse. Did you ever notice that? Look at it next time. Um, and so Ganesha is the patron of writing and arts and sciences of intellectual pursuit. Um, Ganesha is the remover of barriers. Elephant, right? So Ganesha is one of the most beloved and favorite gods. They're also Surya, who is the chief solar deity. The Hindus do worship the, um, the astronomy in terms of the sun, the moon, etc. Surya, the solar god, is a primary focus. Now, there's uh, Smartism is another denomination, and they worship a collection of five gods, including Ganesha, Surya, and others. This is not Arabic. I know people see that and think it's Arabic. This is Sanskrit, the ancient language that is the foundation for the uh, Hindi, the some other modern Indian languages, and also the foundation language for Hinduism. This is three characters put together, and they form the Om. Om, which is the divine sound. It represents the uh, Brahman. Also, one of the characters in here is the character for Atman. Atman is your personal soul, my personal soul, my inner being. The, the deepest source of what makes me me is my Atman. It's my soul. Well, the idea is that my soul, or Atman, is part of and given to me by Brahman. And so the character for the Atman is included in this Sanskrit character, which means the Brahman. Um, that's the, the divine that is in me. You then have the three Trimurti, Brahma, the creator, looking in all directions at once. You have Vishnu, the protector, who is always shown with a blue skin, for instance, and is holding various items in his... Uh, four arms, and then you have Shiva the destroyer. Shiva always has a third eye and often has a necklace of skulls, and there are other characteristics as well. But they are the creator, the protector, and the destroyer. Of these three, Vishnu the protector uh, or preserver and Shiva the destroyer are the ones that are most often considered the most powerful. Hindu beliefs and terminology, I'm going to give you a bunch of words now, uh, and I have to do this because it's the easiest way for me to talk about these important principles that exist. Um, you flip over here. First is Dharma. Dharma means that which supports the universe. It's what is right, what is the ultimate truth, rightness, balance. It's the way that it ought to be. That is Dharma, and it is the dominant philosophical principle for what Hinduism is trying to accomplish. Karma. Um, interesting, you know, Dharma. You remember the 1990s comedy series, Dharma and Greg? That was an interesting name, but I can top it. I had a friend of mine who's the daughter of Christian missionaries, and they named their daughter Karma. Um, karma are the accumulated sum of a person's good and bad deeds. Whatever you do has consequences. Karma is the plus or minus that you're making to your column 
in terms of your actions, because it will come back. Um, then samsara is the continuing cycle of birth, life, and death, and rebirth. It is transmigration of the soul, what we often would call reincarnation, samsara. The Atman, as I said, is your, your spirit or true self of every person. They have a true self that is not, cannot be changed in any way. It's who they are. The Avatar, a deliberate descent of a deity to earth, a manifestation of a deity in some other form on earth. The, a mantra, a sacred utterance, a sound or syllable, word or group of words believed to have power. They're not just noises. It's believed that they have real power. This is why, you know, reading some of the um, Vedic writings, they believe can be dangerous because words have power. You have to be prepared for it. Yoga, how many of all have ever taken a yoga class? Right? Good. It's a good thing. But yoga in Hinduism is a path or practice of discipline for the mind, body, and spirit. I'm going to give you the different kinds of yoga in just a minute. Just because you've been to a yoga class does not mean you became a Hindu. Don't misunderstand this. Um, puja is worship or prayer directed to Brahma or his avatars. Bhakti is devotional practices, especially to personal gods. Most Hindu families will have their own personal god. They will choose one. And they will set up a murti, it's called, which is an icon or a, an idol, you might say, to that particular deity that is their household god. They, they may recognize others, Shiva, Vishnu, others, and in fact, they maybe want those, one of those might be the one they choose. But they will worship their own god in their own homes through the murti, and that's called bhakti. Divas or angelic beings or lesser gods, of which there are more than 330 million, and then ahimsa, is the Hindu principle of nonviolence. You all know about the fact that cows are allowed to wander the streets in Indian cities, in, in predominantly Hindu cities. The reason for that is because the cow represents the mother goddess. But more than that, most seriously practicing Hindus are lacto-vegetarians. Because part of their belief, the belief of ahimsa, is not killing any living being because all beings have manifestation of Brahman, the ultimate reality in them. They are in some way divine. So they do not kill cows and eat them. A lot of uh, lacto-vegetarians will not eat anything that has had to be killed. Jainism, which came out of Hinduism, which we'll talk about in a few days, is the ultimate expression of that in that a Jain practitioner, a serious one, will wear a, a face mask and carry a small broom. And when they walk along, this keeps them from inhaling any insects and killing them, and they brush the sidewalk in front of them so that they don't step on anything and kill it. That's how far they carry in Jain, serious Jainism, the ahimsa, the non, uh, you know, the non-killing of, of the principle of non-violence. There are three karmas and four yogas. The first karma is the accumulated sum. Well, oh, karma is the accumulated sum of good and bad deeds. The first one is the kriyamana or current. What you do today, the act of karma, the plus and minus of your actions being done now, the effects of which you will not know till later. What goes around comes around. Okay, You'll feel it later. The second kind is called sanchita. This is the accumulated karma from past lives that has followed you to the present. One of the reasons that historically they have supported um, a caste system called the varnas in, in the Hindu beliefs is the belief is if you were born poor and as a servant, then this is a result of something you did in the past. If you were born wealthy or in, you know, to uh, great good fortune, then that's because of something positive you did in the past. These are results of sanchita, the past accumulation of karma based upon how you lived your life. And then there is the pravata, the fruit bearing. That's the part of the unalterable sanchita that has led to where you are today. Okay. In other words, that's the practical manifestation of the sanchita in your life. So there are three kinds of karmas, all of which from either now or the past affect where you are now and will affect where you are in the future. Yoga are Hindu paths or practices of discipline. They are how you can achieve greater righteousness in your life, to achieve what Brahman desires of you. There is karma yoga, which is action in doing what is right, there is uh, nana yoga, which is the knowledge leading to awareness. So, acting right, learning, and becoming aware. The third raja yoga is meditation to cultivate the mind. 
And the fourth kind of yoga is bhakti yoga, love towards God in worship. Bhakti is how you practice puja, the worship of the, of the deities. Now, all of those may involve physical disciplines and exercises as well, including twisting yourself into unnatural contortions uh, sometimes. But if you have had a yoga class, you've not done any of this, unless you really went to a, you know, a spiritual yoga master. What you have done is hatha yoga. A um, long time ago, they created a purely secular version of yoga, which is intended to help improve the body and the mind, make one you know, both more flexible, healthier, etc. That's called hatha yoga. It does not have any spiritual connotations. It is entirely a physical discipline and a very healthy one. Uh, all, all the research has demonstrated that. But yoga is one of the ways in which a Hindu person can gain righteousness that they're supposed to be achieving. And then the four aims, the purusharthas of Hinduism, the doctrine of the fourfold end of life. These are the goals we should have. Uh, the prihashta dharma, the domestic religion, that is for us. We are called the, the pravriti, unless there's somebody in the group that has chosen to be a renunciate Hindu monk. Um, you are pravriti, those who are living in the world. We have four goals for our life, according to Hinduism. One, dharma of righteousness, right living. We need to live right. We need to be good. Secondly, artha, wealth and material prosperity. Unlike some religions, Hinduism not only doesn't condemn gaining wealth, it advocates it as one of the things you're supposed to pursue, to gain wealth and prosperity, than to use it in the right way, but to seek wealth. Third is kama. As we said, kama is gratification of the senses, pleasure, sensuality, particularly sexual and mental enjoyment. This is encouraged. You should pursue this. Fourth is moksha, which is liberation from samsara and rebirth, the supreme goal of humankind to get out of the samsara cycle of birth, life, death, rebirth. Now those are the four goals for us, for ordinary people, the uh, pavriti. If you are a nivriti, meaning someone who has renounced the world, who is living as a Hindu monk, then there is only one goal for you, and that is moksha. The rest of it, gaining wealth, any gratification of the senses, trying to live righteousness in some way, all of those are not your problem. They're not your goal. Your whole focus is to discipline yourself in a way that you can get out of samsara and gain moksha, the release from having to be re reborn. Ten disciplines. Satya, the truth. Always tell the truth. Ahimsa, nonviolence against people and all other living creatures. Third, the brahmacharya, which is non-adultery or in some cases celibacy. It means you know uh, to be sexually conservative in terms of your relationship uh, with your spouse. The astaya, no stealing, and even more, no desire to possess something that is not rightfully yours. Oops. The apargara, which is non-corruption, to never do something that is dishonest or false, but to, to be true. The shauka, oh, and I should say these first five, are considered the five principles of morality within uh, Hinduism for all people. Then we have uh, shausha, cleaningness, cleanliness, santosh, which is contentment to find satisfaction in your life, the swarajaya, the reading of scriptures, tapas, which are not small Spanish bites of food. It means austerity, perseverance, penance, to be able to, to have uh, um, patience and stick with it this I made that word up. The Ishwara Pranadan, which is regular prayers. These are the ten disciplines of Hinduism, which are advocated in, in their uh, holy writings. Now, the Hindu social classes, most of you have heard about, they are called Varnas in Hinduism. They are categories of life that is believed that you were born into. They are referred to in the Shastras, the holy writings, especially in the Bhagavad Gita, um, it identifies that all people belong to one of four of these social classes. There is serious disagreement as to whether or not the Bhagavad Gita is saying that this is necessary and required or simply observing this as, as what is and who's been responsible for maintaining this. The top category or class or varna are the Brahmins, the Vedic teachers and priests, the religious leaders. Second, we have the Kshatriyas, which are the warriors and kings. The third Vartra, uh, or uh, Varna is the Vaishyas, farmers and merchants. And the fourth are the Shudras, servants and laborers. 
Whether it was intended that way or not, it historically typically has been interpreted that whichever class you were born into, you're supposed to stay there. And that the opportunities that you have in life are going to be strictly along the line of what varna you were born into. That's what we know of as the caste system. Um, within these four, there are hundreds of more sublevels. The lowest levels of the shudras were called the untouchables. And the reason is because typically they were given work to do like um, touching dead bodies or you know, uh, skinning animals or cleaning toilets or things that were considered polluting. Remember, cleanliness is very important, the purification kinds of things. Because of that, they were considered polluted and it could not be touched by anyone because that pollution would be carried on. And so they were the lowest caste. There has been much opposition to this over the years, as you can imagine. Uh, the British worked very hard to try to get rid of this as a caste system. Some people, now historians, Indian historians, are looking back and saying that in many ways the British during their occupation of India encouraged this in some ways by the way they treated people and the kind of positions they gave them, the jobs that people were assigned to. But this is uh, now illegal in terms of any enforcement of this, although socially it is still practiced, especially in rural areas. It is true that um, there has been a president of India who was from the Shudra class. Now, the president is mostly just a uh, symbolic position. The prime minister is the one who runs the governments, but still that was pretty significant. So they have made changes and they're still making changes, but especially in the rural areas, this is still very much a controlling social factor. This is the largest temple. It is in Delhi. It's the Shwaminarya, the Ashkaranda. I don't, by the way, couldn't tell, I don't speak um, either Hindi or Sanskrit. But uh, this is the largest temple in the world. These words are very hard to pronounce. Um, within a temple like this, they have murtis or icons, statues of the various deities. There may be a deity that's the special focus of a temple and it will have central place. Or the major deities may be sort of in the center and people have the ability to walk around the courtyard inside around these deities to provide offerings of food, um, which, which is a standard thing that they do. In, in a, a home, when people are, a family is worshiping, typically uh, a good Hindu would wake up in the morning and uh, bathe so that they're cleansed. They would come to the murti of their favorite god and they would first announce a vow. They would announce who they are and welcome that the god is present in their home and then commit something in terms of here's why I'm here, here's what I desire. And then they would make an offering of food or drink and they would um, do prayers, mantras to the God, and then afterwards the family would gather and they would take the food and consume it. Um, it's not like they put the food down there and they leave it and go, why isn't he eating that? You know. Um, so they, they then consume the food, or you can go to a temple and have a priest do that for you. And then the priest will share in the food as well. Um, so this is the basic faith of Islam. Hinduism. I'm gonna take or in Islam, of Hinduism. Anybody who's Islamic would have been offended by that. Uh, this is uh, Hinduism. I'm going to spend just a few more minutes talking briefly about Zoroastrianism, and then I'll take some questions. Zoroastrianism, this is the only slide I have there, is again a very ancient religion. It came out of Iran or Persia. When in the 8th century and following, uh, the 800s and following, so the, uh, the Islamic forces from Saudi Arabia came over and invaded Persia and they persecuted the Zoroastrian and they many of them most of them in fact fled further to the east into India there they became known as Parsis which as I said before is the Hindi word for uh, Persian the Zoroastrian religion it, while very ancient its basic belief is that there is one deity. A lot of people think it's monotheistic. I, I think it's dualistic. But there's a primary deity who is called Ahura Mazda, which means the wise lord. Ahura Mazda, and in fact this, this uh, faith is uh, sometimes called Mazdaism, um, after, after the name of their primary deity. There is a secondary being that exists who is called Ariman. There are other names for them as well. So you have the creator God, who is the source of all good, who is called Ahura Mazda. You have the evil spirit, and in fact one of the names for Ahriman actually means the, the angry spirit, 
whereas the other names for Ahura Mazda are the benevolent spirit. Those two are seen as having been in conflict with one another, sort of fighting tooth and nail for control of the universe since the beginning of creation. This is why I think it's more dualistic. They would say that Ahura Mazda, within Zoroastrianism, that Ahura Mazda is all-powerful but not all-omnipotent. Uh, I haven't quite figured out what the difference is. But that's what they say, and that's why he hasn't been able to defeat Ahriman yet. Eventually, they believe that he will overthrow Ahriman and that all things will be made right in creation. Um, there is a major focus, and it's represented here and here, in fire and water. Those are two powerful uh, symbols. They are believed to be the primary pieces of creation. That fire is the thing from which you gain all knowledge, and so most of the temples, the Zoroastrian or Parsi temples, will, are seen as temples of fire, and they will have a fire altar. Even in people's homes, if there's Zoroastrianism, they will have a fire altar. Now today, any source of light is considered a legitimate um, fire representation, so even a light bulb. Um, they will, fire is always present in Zoroastrian worship. They believe that fire came out of water, that water was created first and that it is the source. And so anytime you go to a Zoroastrian or Parsi temple, you will see um, fire and water represented as major elements or themes there. There is a lot in Zoroastrianism that, um, that focuses similarly on righteous conduct, righteous act, that human beings are given a right of choice, we have a free will, we are responsible to do right things, to do good things. And if we, almost like karma, if we do good, good will return to us. If we do evil, then evil will occur to us. They have, um, there's three statements. This, um, this is a, the primary symbol for Zoroastrianism. Um, this is a place, actually still in Iran, this big stone, You'll notice that this is the same symbol here, and see the birds overhead. The idea of order versus chaos is how they see the difference between um, Ahura Mazda and Ahriman. It's light and dark. It's, um, it's order and chaos. Because of that, a major feature, like some other religions, but even more so in Zoroastrianism, is, is the idea of purification that you cannot allow yourself to be polluted. If so, it's a long process by which you then get cleansed again. And they believe that dead bodies, I think I mentioned before, dead bodies are a primary source of pollution, as are bodily fluids and, you know, read some of the laws of Leviticus. They get into some of the same things. Which, but in Zoroastrianism, and this is only practiced in India now, when a person dies, they are cleansed, but then they are put at the top of what's called a tower of silence, and allowed to be eaten by birds. Their body, their flesh is cleansed by birds, then their bones are cremated, um, and it, in cases where, because of law or whatever, they're not allowed to do that, then they will either cremate the body and put the ashes, or if they can't cremate them, the, the body, inside a lime mortar sealed uh, grave, so that there will be no leakage into the soil, because that's considered a pollution of the soil from the dead body. So they're very particular about that. But Towers of Silence, uh, when they're still allowed to be used, uh, the bodies of the dead will be put there to be, can, their flesh to be consumed by birds, and then they will deal with the bodies, the bones later on. That is not legal in many places now for the very strange reason that the use of antibiotics in people and in animals has almost killed off all of the various carrion birds in these parts of the world. And, um, you know, Antibiotics and various other chemicals that we have in our bodies are killing the birds. And so in many places they're not allowed to put the, the bodies out anymore because of that. There aren't enough birds to, to consume all the flesh anyway. There are three principles of conduct in Zoroastrianism. Humata, Hukyata, Huvarshta, which means good thoughts, good words, good deeds. That's the direction. They also, other major statements of their beliefs are there is only one path, and that is the path of truth. There is never justification for lying, for deceit, for anything else. It was, must always be true. And then third, do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. And then all beneficial rewards to come, will come to you also. That's sort of the karmic effect, as I was talking about. Do what's right because it's right, not because you're going to get rewarded for it. Even if you're going to get punished for it, you do the right thing. This is very much part of their belief system. And the belief is that eventually, 
Um, Ahur Mazda will overcome Ahriman, that he will destroy all of the chaos and institute order, and those who have been obedient in following him and have been righteous in their lives will be resurrected to live with him. The belief is that life is only a temporary state anyway. Um, so this is, these are the basic beliefs. You know, you have M, the symbols of fire. Uh, this, is, this is a symbol of a guardian spirit because they do believe in angels and demons and guardian spirits. In addition to uh, the creator, uh, Hora Mazda, and the, the sort of demonic power of Ariman. And again, you'll see these symbols of the fire pit as well. Very quick introduction to Zoroastrianism. When you go, uh, if you go on the, sp the spiritual legacy to the Tower of Silence, I don't know if in Mumbai they still are allowed to put out, you know, the dead bodies to be consumed by birds or not. We will not be allowed to go in to the Zoroastrian Temple or Tower of Silence because we are not members. But uh, you'll at least have a chance to see it from the outside, and probably you will see the symbol because it is usually on any any Zoroastrian um, center temple, Tower of Silence. 